Darren and Julia is just the name I've given this case study, that's all. And here is the case study. Now, if you're listening on the podcast, I'll kind of read it out to you, so it might help, really. But Darren and Julia are first-time buyers who have come to the Glen Roths Building Society for a loan. They've asked for an explanation of the various mortgage and protection products available and for assistance in helping them decide which are appropriate for their circumstances. Darren is 27, has been self-employed since qualifying as an electrician. He was made bankrupt at 23 when a large client went out of business before paying him. He was discharged after two years. Since then, he's built up a new business and now makes a gross profit of £30,000 per annum. Julia is 25 and has been self-employed hairdresser since she was 21, earning 19,000 per annum. This is her only income. Now that Darren has rebuilt his business, Julia's parents have doubled her savings of 15,000 pounds to enable them to put a deposit on a flat, for which they've offered 145,000 against the asking price of 149,995 pounds. Darren's parents are assisting with other moving expenses and some furniture. Although their budget is limited, they're anxious to ensure that Darren and Julia make appropriate checks regarding the property. Their proposed flat is in a block of six in the town centre. The block was constructed in 1960 and has recently had repairs to the roof and windows. Darren wishes to reduce their outstanding capital as soon as possible. Julia feels that life cover may be important for starting a family. Both agree that stability of expenses and cost savings in the early years is essential. However, they do not want to suffer any subsequent penalties unless they are in a position to repay the loan. So there we have one interesting case study. Now, there's 10 questions that follow, and each question covers different topic areas. So let's take a look at some of the, the question topics that crop up on this one for you. Question number one in the, um, in the exam itself talks about Darren and the effect of his bankruptcy. So question number one here is the bankruptcy. There you go. Now, you probably realize it was going to be a question because, you know, they wouldn't put it in the case study unless, of course, it's a topic. And the question really was saying, well, what's the effect of his mortgage application on his past misdemeanors? And it will be taken into account. Of course it will. There may or may not be a record on the credit um, search engine, depending on the time in which it's, it was you know, a long time ago. But you need to declare the fact if you've been made bankrupt before. Now, being bankrupt is not a good thing, however you look at it. But he was discharged, and he has climbed back up again now. So more than likely, the lender's going to take the application into account and look at it on its merits. They won't automatically reject it. Some might, but most lenders will at least talk to the couple about the situation. So that's the question number one, which is not too bad really, is it? The bankruptcy question. Question number two talks about um, Julia and her self-employment. Just jot it up there for you. And the question itself really is what information is going to be required to confirm her self-employment? Now, if you remember, she earns £19,000 per annum as a self-employed hairdresser. And she's been doing that since she was 21. That's all you really know about her situation. And it gives you a number of options. What information will they require to corroborate her income? And they give examples of business plans and things like that. Now, strictly speaking, all the lender will require here is confirmation of her net profits for for tax purposes her net profits which she then declares the tax man pays tax on now the net profits as you know for self-employed are the income she makes from cutting people's hair less the costs of running that business and that's her net profits and we we need to look at those figures in order to determine a mortgage capability now Sometimes a lender might look at the report and accounts, the profit and loss, uh, possibly, unlikely these days. They tended to confirm her salary or her net profits by looking at an SA302. An SA302 is a HMRC form, effectively, which confirms all the income that Julia has. And that's usually typically enough. They won't look for things like business plans or balance sheets or anything like that, not for, not for her situation. So that's where question number two takes you. It's quite an interesting question. Now, question number three is similar for Darren's self-employment. 
You see, what they're trying to do now, they're trying to apply for the mortgage. So we're looking now at uh, young Darren's self-employment. And again, it's a similar type of question. And what they're looking at now is what kind of figure are they going to be taking into account? Um, if you can remember the case study, it said Darren is self-employed and he has built up a new business and now makes a gross profit of £30,000 per annum. They've used the phrase gross profit. Now that's probably to confuse. What we look for, of course, for mortgages is net profit. Nothing to do with tax. This is uh, his income he makes from doing his building work, less the costs of running the firm, or his, his self-employment if you like. And that gives his net profits. So that's probably a question that they're going to look at. Now in the multiple choice uh, options, it does talk about net profits and, and, and an average of three years net profits or maybe a climbing net profits taking into account the last figure as well. So that's where that particular question takes you, which is, again is another interesting question. Now question number four segues over now, let's just put it here for you, and takes a look at the, the security, the property. There you go. Again, we've done the individual, now we're going to take a look at the property itself. And what they're looking to do, of course, is they're buying a flat which is in the town centre and it's a block of six flat in the town centre. So they're asking questions around that, constructed in 1960 and has recently had some repairs to the roof and the windows. Again, th they're, they're talking about the issues around that flat and the question talks about leases, how, what's the unexpired term of the lease. We don't know that from the case study, but there's a question around that. Um, whether it being in the town centre is an issue, uh, maybe it's above a shop, a commercial premises, that might be an issue. And um, the repairs and the maintenance charges around a flat is also talked about as well in the question. Again, you need to look at the question to see what it's looking for. But uh, that's the kind of topic area that that, that particular question is around. Again, you need to have knowledge about tenure. You need to have knowledge about flats above shops. And also the repairs and maintenance charges, because it's had repairs, which is good. So previous owners have paid for that, haven't they, in their maintenance charge. Because a flat in England and Wales will have ground rent to pay, but also a maintenance charge to go to the, uh, the communal areas to make sure they're maintained and fixed when necessary. So that's, that's question number four, it wasn't a particularly difficult one. Section number five is the type of survey that you might want to have on the flat. And the question is talking about the best survey. Now the best survey, and, and broadly you've got three, and you've got the basic mortgage valuation, then you've got the home buyer's report, and then you've got the full building survey. They're the, the three basic ones which are applicable for purchasers. Now it's a 1960s block, so it's not old. Um, it's £250,000, so it's expensive, but it's not that expensive. Again, you need to look at the clues in the case study. And it says that they, they wish to make um, a, you know, a good purchase. They're anxious to ensure that Darren and Julia make appropriate checks regarding the property. So that's the parents, of course, who are stumping up some cash. They want them to make sure they do appropriate checks on the property. So the question is looking, which, which uh, survey report is the best one? And it talks about a home buyer's report being the answer for this one. It's like a, a middle ground one, isn't it? That's what they're looking at. So that's question number five. Question number six in this case study takes a look at identified needs. There you go. Identified needs is the phrase we use for the type of mortgage they're looking at, the mortgage method. So the method of, of, of repayment. Now this is really important. Now the method of repayment of course is capital and interest or interest only. They're the two methods. Don't get confused with products and stuff. And the identified need is what's in the case study that means you identify the need for which method of repayment. Again, you need to look at the case study. It says here that Darren wishes to reduce their outstanding capital as soon as possible. Now that's an identified need and it's telling me that he was looking for a mortgage that gets repaid, the debt gets repaid over time. Um, and that's the only clue in there. It doesn't want to suffer any subsequent penalties but that's the mortgage product that that refers to. There's always a phrase or a sentence in there that tells you what identified need, what product or what method is appropriate. This one's mortgage method and the fact is he wants to reduce the outstanding capital as soon as possible tells me that a capital and interest mortgage is the one for them. So that's where that one goes. 
Now, the question number seven talks about um, early repayment. Here we go. Early repayment of the mortgage. Early repayment. And it's referring to the MCOB rules on early repayment. Because if he takes out some kind of fixed rate mortgage and pays it off early, the, he will have a redemption penalty to pay. And it's asking you, how, how does MCOBs treat redemption penalties? And the, the phrase they're looking for here is the, uh, the, the clog on redemption, as it's often known as. Sounds awful, doesn't it? Clog on redemption. This means that the lender, of course, is entitled to charge a redemption penalty. But if it's onerous and enormous, you know, if it's just far too much money, then that might actually prevent the customer from redeeming the mortgage. It creates a clog on redemption. So that's really where the MCOB 13 goes when it comes to uh, to redemption penalties. And that's what that question's asking around um, redemption penalties. Interesting issue, isn't it, with consumer duty coming into the fore at the moment. Now, question number eight talks about another identified need. Let's keep it over here for you. So again, we're into identified needs again. But this time, there you go, it's, it's referring to the product that's wanted. So it's the mortgage product. Now, you've got to get yourself comfortable with the phrases method, vehicle, product, and plan. Mortgage method is capital interest, interest only. The vehicle is the repayment vehicle for an interest only mortgage. The mortgage product is your fix, cap, that sort of thing. And plan is your insurance plans. That's the phraseology they use. You've got to get used to it. Now, it's asking you for the identified need now for the mortgage product. And again, looking at the case study, it says there that um, Darren obviously wishes to reduce the outstanding capital. So that's a repayment mortgage. Both agree that stability of expenses and cost savings in the early years is essential. Um, they do not want to suffer any subsequent penalties unless they are in a position to repay their loan. So stability of expenses is definitely fixed rate territory. Savings in the early years is essential. So it could be a discounted mortgage as well. But the fact is they don't want to suffer any subsequent penalties tells me that they don't want a fixed rate mortgage because they've got redemption penalties. So we're probably looking at some kind of, uh, of, of discounted variable rate mortgage possibly. But again, you need to look at the question for that one. But it's the identified need, and I've identified the phrase in the case study that tells you that. That's number eight, which is an interesting one. A couple more questions for you just to give you some more topic areas. Question number nine is an interesting one. Again, this is the... The, the method of repayment is what they're, they're driving at here. Let's just pop question number nine down here, shall we? So we can see where we are this one. And what they're looking at is capital and interest mortgage versus interest only. And what they're driving at here with this question is what kind of life assurance is needed to protect different methods of repaying a mortgage. And broadly speaking here, they're looking at um, capital and interest, which is decreasing term assurance and interest only, which is level term assurance. That's, that's the, the answer to the question. So capital interest mortgage, of course, goes down over, over the years. Therefore, you want a life assurance policy that also goes down. Whereas an interest only mortgage, the debt remains the same. So you want to have life assurance where the life cover remains the same. Level term assurance would, would be the one. Sometimes you might have it built in. So for example, if you had an interest-only mortgage with an endowment policy, there you go. and I know endowment policies haven't been sold for 20 years, but uh, people still have them, and that's probably why they keep, keep testing you on that topic. The endowment policy, the great thing about it is it automatically included life assurance. How cool is that? So there's no need to, to get any extra. But if you have an ISA or a pension plan to you know, repay the mortgage or re sale of property, then a level term assurance is necessary. So that's where we got um, question number nine. Great. And question number 10, as always, they're going to throw in a stamp duty land tax question. 
because they always do. And you don't get the tax sheet anymore in the exam, so you have to memorise these. England and Wales is probably what button you've ticked. It might be Scotland, so make sure you know the stamp duty rates. And they're asking here, you know, these guys are first-time buyers. What's, what's the rate of stamp duty they're going to be paying? What is it, 150? So even if they weren't first-time buyers, it would still be a 0% or nil pounds because they're first-time buyers. They're asking you about flats versus houses. So they're trying to get you confused with different stamp duty rates for flats versus houses, which is a bit naughty. It's the same. It doesn't matter what the property construction is. And of course, it would be nil this one as well, wouldn't it? So that's quite an interesting overview, really, of, of the 10 questions. Do, what I would like to do, of course, is just add a quick few, few more things for you as well. We've got um, the, the total package of, of protection that I would do for this, this couple. So let's just put that in here for you. Ideally, if uh, money was no object, and they don't talk about premiums in the exam, this young couple who are single people would want to have um, income protection plan, IPP, in income protection plan and I would do that at the dip stage in other words when they're talking to me about their affordability chatting about what they can borrow that kind of stuff to get a, you know a decision in principle I would talk about IPP and get that um, advised at that point when it comes to their mortgage they will probably want a capital and interest mortgage so I would do a level term assurance I might even do two single policies actually for them two single policies um, in trust, of course, if you're going to be building them single. And if you could, I would even add critical illness to that as well, because it wouldn't cost that much money. Don't automatically go for joint life, you see. It's not always the right thing. These people are single. Okay, they, they're, they're partners, and I get all of that, but they may not be for it together forever. And besides, it doesn't matter whether you're married or not. Two single policies gives you really good advantages over a joint policy, usually only for a couple of pounds more, so that's good advice all round. So that's the case study of Darren and Julia. I hope you found that useful. Bye. <laughs>